you spend your winters in New Zealand. Why New Zealand? The days are longer. Uh-huh. <laughs> My, this is, uh, I'm trying to, I want to give you the real answer, but it's not fair to do so. There is a family member who really does have seasonal affective disorder. Yeah. And as I said to somebody who is proof positive that SAD is not something that the shrinks invented to make higher fees. Yeah. And so short days are painful. Yeah. And, you know, we had many, many friends who go down to South Carolina or Florida or something like that, but you don't gain anything in terms of the day length. You know, probably if you go to South Carolina, you get 3.7 minutes or something like that. So you've got to go deep south. Um, and, well, there's there's no we, – we love it. We have – I'm sure you know the term. A lot of people who are who are listening to us or watching us don't. It's called batch, but batch is B-A-C-H, which is short for bachelor, and it's little shacks on the beach. And we literally have a 700-square-foot shack 25 yards from the Tasman Sea, and it's just gorgeous. And, uh, you know, it's a spectacular geographically – uh, spectacular climatologically and as silly as it is to make these kinds of comments, Kiwis are nice people. Yeah. You know, by and large, I said to somebody, a Kiwi would have no idea what you were talking about. If you uttered the phrase work life balance, they work as hard as you and I do or anybody else does, but they understand that, you know, they go, hiking on the weekend yeah. and it wouldn't necessarily occur to them that they're supposed to work 60 60 24 7 they're not they're not they're not slackers in any way but they have a life and you know the, the the funny part of it is despite all the technology that you know we're using here and so on uh it's really still at the end of the world and i would never want to say anything critical but at the end of three months we kind of need to be, even though we read the Washington Post and the New York Times every morning online, we kind of need to be back in the middle of the fray, which is just, I guess, our Americanization showing. And it's not that they don't care. It's not that they're not sophisticated, but they're at the end of the world. And they always have been at the end of the world. There's a huge Chinese influx into greater Auckland now that you know may or may not change things. And they are having the same problem as the rest of the world. Their new prime minister, who is an under 40 pregnant woman who's not married, which I love, um, is they're, they're talking about pretty serious restrictions on foreign property buying mm -hmm. because they've got a shortage of places for Kiwis in Auckland. And it's it isn't people like my wife and I exactly because we're on the beach many miles away, but it's a whole bunch of people who own real estate who are there two weeks a year. Yeah. And gotcha. that doesn't make a damn bit of difference in London or New York. It makes a difference in a country of 4 million people. Yeah. Parking money, basically. Yeah. 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 It's money. It's, it's a legal, legal, legal or mostly legal money laundering. We have a good friend who uh, actually has a, huge amount of commercial property and he got a, a a very extraordinary offer from a chinese buyer and i don't remember what the upshot of it was but he said i've i've really got to do my due diligence first to make sure that the money flowing through is that it's not laundering yeah, yeah. Of, course, of course with all due respect london is built on money laundering <laughs> to, to some horrible degree yeah so it's going to be so fat and fascinating that's really the wrong word isn't it to see what's going to happen to London over the next 36 months as a function of Brexit. Yes. Oh my God. What a shocker. <laughs> Unbelievable. Uh, yeah. I had, I had, there was a, we had, we had a summer, uh, party that was at the end of somebody's dock and they had a friend who was a Brit, not a financier. But I think he was actually a big time art dealer. And I think it may have been about a week before Brexit and just because I'm statistically trained and skeptical about everything, I said something to him like, you know, well, doesn't seem to me like it's it was innocent, like it's necessarily a sure thing. 
He treated me like I was oh, yeah. a baby. He yeah. just slammed me. He looked at me. His face turned funny color. He said, you just don't get it. There is no issue. There is no way that this could happen. And he just, you know, the insults yeah. were, you know, rolling through him. And, you know, which, of course, is exactly what we said on the 8th of November in 2016 in the United States. So yeah. uh, more fool we, yeah. fools we. Yeah, that was a year of learning. <laughs> Time to no, go boy, vote. Yeah, that's a nice way to put it. <laughs> My goodness. So, Tom, I wanted to say thank you so much uh, because your book was fantastic uh, for influence on me many, many years ago uh, In you. Search of Excellence. I remember starting off doing manufacturing engineering in England, uh, studying for manufacturing engineering. I looked up at these big old shelves that were on business management. And I thought, I need to read some of these. I need to get enthused about this discipline. And a lot of them were not very, the kinds of kind of, kind of stiff, rolling, terse books that didn't really summon much in the way of motivation. I came across your book, and uh, it's kind of the, the bright light of a, of a four-year education, really. It actually so much of a bright light. Oh, it got wow. me to convert to engineering management. So thank you very much. Um, that was great to read your new book. Oh, thank, thank you very much. No, thanks. Um, well, thank like you it's... very much for that comment. Never gets old. So, you know, a lot's changed in that time. 26 years since I read In Search of Excellence, and now we have the Excellence Dividend. Um, what would you say has happened in, in, in terms of the business mastery genre? Because it seems like the, that those shells were rather small 26 years ago, and now there's no end of business mastery oh. books. So what's changed? Well, in our case, the Americans, of course, had ruled the roost after World War II, and then suddenly in the mid-70s, we discovered that everybody was buying Japanese cars, and the week that In Search of Excellence came out in 1982, actually, uh, the Americans announced 10% unemployment, which was completely unheard of at the time, and the way I like to say it, which certainly played into my hands, or my and my co-author's hands, was overnight the business books moved from the back of the bookstore to the front of the bookstore. Yeah. And that certainly was the case. The part that I can't tell you about, because my history isn't good enough, uh, in a way, I, I'd only 80% agree with you. It was business books, and then there was some kind of a global explosion of self-help books mm -hmm. in general uh, you know, that, that took off at about the same time. And I don't, I don't know. I haven't, you know, nobody's asked me that question, which is to your everlasting credit. I, I don't know why part, part of it, I guess, which sounds egocentric is part of it was because our book was so ludicrously successful. Yeah. I believe there was a guy by the name of yeah. Bob Townsend. He actually invented the American express card and he had written a book called Up the Organization that probably you don't know or what have you. But it was the first business book to ever make it onto a bestseller list. And that was four or five years before us. And then we, of course, did make it onto a bestseller list and stayed on. So that it was an awareness thing. Uh, and, you know, other than that, I haven't, I haven't really got a good answer as to why the, but you're right the business book shelves now uh just bulge and that's an understatement and they're not that far back in the bookshops <laughs> no they aren't no they absolutely they absolutely aren't well and every and every time unemployment goes up or whatever else uh you know they they nudge a little closer to the to the front for some period of time there was one other book that i remember uh, which you might recall eli goldratt's the goal Absolutely. Yeah, that that was a great read as well. No, the, and the and far more than uh, in search of excellence in a way. The in my experience, the gold ratians, if that's not a horrible misuse of the language, are religious in their belief of what's. It's like, and, and this is not said with any criticism. It's like the people who are well. Th the other one that comes to mind when you said gold rat is Stephen Covey's Seven Habits. Yeah, yeah, yeah which, uh, you know, became almost like a religious discipline. And I think there have been a handful. Well, the one minute manager, my yeah. college roommate was Kenny Blanchard, who was the co-author of the one minute manager. And that took off like a, 
you know, like, and, and then he, he, and was it he, or was it somebody else who was his co-author? Then there was, which I think is still selling like hotcakes. Do you remember the one that was called who moved, who moved my, my cheese? cheese? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I think the rhythm <laughs> I'm still not sure what it was about, but it, <laughs> you know, it sure moved off the bookstore shelves. Yeah. And like the guy who runs, um, who ran Southwest airlines, Herb Kelleher. Yes, yes. Uh, I believe I heard that Herb bought a copy of who moved my cheese for each of his 23,000 employees. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's the, it's the real deal now. Wise move. You read in the run up to writing your book over a hundred books. And, um, I, I think that's what, you really, I, I read the book and it was very much a, uh, a tour de force, if you like, of the best business books in existence at this stage. Um, I remember you mentioned the, the soft edge you, you said was your favorite book of the decade. I did. What was your second? Oh gosh. Oh Jesus. <laughs> um, that's, uh, what would be my second? Well, I'm going to do what any good person on my side of a conversation does, and which is not to answer your question and divert you. Let's let's talk about the hundred. Let me let me let me do my little riff on the hundred books, and then we'll, then we'll try. Uh, maybe it would be God, author's name. There's a book called The Glad. Here was the deal. I had the arrogance to believe that for about twenty years. I might have been one eighth of a step ahead of the herd. And then I woke up one morning three or four years ago and I couldn't even see the tail end of the herd. Yeah. Mainly as a function of the of the technology changes. And thanks to my mother who turned me into a reader at the age of four, whenever I have a big problem, my answer is always books. And so I thought, I'm going to see if I can read my way out of my doldrums or whatever, whatever you want to call it. And so I read everything I could get my hands on in terms of social media, big data, uh, et cetera. And my, my assessment of myself a hundred books later is I'm still sure as hell not an expert, but I can now have intelligent conversations. Yeah. with experts. And that's a, you know, that's a, that's a big step forward. But, you know, that sounds like a pat line and I know I've used it before, but it's really the truth. I didn't know what else to do except read my way out of the mess. And, you know, one of the things per your point that, I mean, you always like to get a good book review, but one of the big ones for us is Publishers Weekly and we got a starred review. But what I loved, which is of course a little self-serving on their part, is they specifically said at the end of almost every chapter, there's a reading list. And it, the funny thing, the funny thing about that was I didn't really know that until they wrote the review. It was just what I did, as yeah. you said. The yeah. you know the each chapter has an incredible amount of material that is always referenced. Nothing is made up to the best of my knowledge. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, so we end each chapter with, yeah, you know, my, my favorite one of my, uh, of my lists is the one that I call the people first business book club, because one of my huge arguments has been that whether it's 2018 or whether it was way back in 1982, uh, a putting people first is what matters most. An organization is people serving people in 2018 as much as it was in 1918 at some level. And a whole bunch of people have done it right. And so that particular thing says, look, there are 30 books from people who have done it right. Uh, why don't you and your executive team, and I've known this to happen in, in some small number of cases, as you probably have, I said, why don't you, why don't you do a book club? And why don't you read a book a month? And, you know, you don't pay any attention to me. You don't have to listen to me, but, you know, the, read the, read the, read the, read the books by the people who actually pulled one of these things off, like John Mackey, who's the whole foods guy. And, and, uh, and there's a, there's a book that the turn. I'm not in love with the title, but I am in love with the content. It's called Firms F of Endearment. <laughs> and you know, that's that's a little yeah. slightly edgy for me, but it's the real deal. Yeah. It's you know, case studies of fifteen or twenty companies that really got serious about 
you know, putting employees first in all kinds of industries and, uh, you know, as a result that extraordinary work, but I, I can't really, I can't, I mean, what I, what I loved about the soft edge by Rich Carlgard was, and this is a commonality in both your background and mine is it came from a guy who was a serious mover and shaker in Silicon Valley. It wasn't the soft edge being written by X or Y or Z from wherever. But, you know, Rich is the publisher of Forbes magazine. He is a tough cookie. Forbes is a tough cookie world. Uh, and yet what he said was, you know, over the long haul, the companies that pay attention to, you know, the people issues, the trust issues, the teamwork issues, uh, stand the best chance of, of surviving bad as well as good. Yeah. And you know, I, I obviously agree with that. Especially the ones I wrote, I wrote the forward to the book. I must, I must say. And I, and I said, then I said, we said soft is hard. We said hard is soft, soft is hard in, in search of excellence and rich. You said it better than we did. And that was not a throwaway line. It's brilliant. And, and there was another. I recommend it. Everybody who's listening or watching, I'd love to have you buy my book, but for sure buy the soft edge. The soft edge, and terms of in uh, terms of firms, firms of endearment. F I R M S yes. of <laughs> yes. endearment. But we have you know twenty twenty odd books on that list, and yeah. I would uh, you know pretty much well not pretty much I did I would recommend them in print. Gotcha. Now, there's another aspect to your book which is amazing. Uh, the, uh, you, you mentioned some statistics from some studies that were done that looked at the um, more uh, the, the balanced businesses, the businesses that had uh, women on the boards. And I think there was one statistic. I mean, it was amazing how more, much more profitable there were. I mean, so, yeah. so you talk about the, um, you know, we've, we've got to get this, the balance correct at the, at the stage. Yeah, of the there world. was a... There and women was are indeed... A, uh... Better managers. Sorry. Yeah. Now, I say there there was a McKinsey study that said gender balanced board companies wildly outperform those who weren't. And the number in my mind, and it's probably the one you remember because I used a very bold type, uh, 50, 56%, 56 percent yeah. higher <laughs> operating profit. I mean, yeah. holy moly. Well, you know, my argument, the, I started working on women's issues in 1996, and I really started from the outside in. And what I mean by that is women are the principal purchasers of everything. Uh, the roughly the numbers say that, and I think this, this goes across the board, Roughly, the numbers say that uh, 80 percent of consumer goods decisions, including health care, bank accounts, as well as where the family vacation is, are made by women. And in the United States, and this may or may not be true outside the U.S., but in the United States, over 50 percent of professional purchasing officers are women. So not only is she deciding on where the family is going to go on vacation, but it is going to be her signature on the 10-year, $5 billion ISIT RFP that goes out. And there, you know, there's a lot of evidence that suggests that the decision-making process is significantly different between, uh, between men and women. Women tend to – my favorite book in, on the topic, which is mentioned in, um, in The Excellence Dividend, um, written by a woman by the name of Lou Ann Lofton, is called Warren Buffett Invests Like a Girl and Why You Should Too. <laughs> and I love that. And, uh, you know, and the other thing I love about it, which is apparently the case, Buffett had never heard of the book, but <laughs> somebody sent it to him, presumably the author, and he wrote – the first review at Amazon, God oh, bless him. And apparently, I never checked the review up, but apparently he said, I never knew I invested like a girl, but I guess I do. <laughs> and it was more about patience. It was about not getting caught up in the herd. You know, you and I are sitting across from each other at some some place on Wall Street, and you figure you've got the winning deal of all time. And there's only one. Th I'm not interested in making money. I'm interested in making more money than you make. Yeah. And so there's no way in hell I'm going to let this thing escape. And, you know, the women women uh, got a slightly smaller 
dose of testosterone than than you and I do, and they don't take crazy risks and they do more. It's a one. It's a fascinating book, but you know, in general, my my point was. Uh, if you pay attention to your customer, then you have to pay attention to women and marketing to women and designing products for women is not instinctively something that men do particularly well. And, and I call it in my book, the, the, uh, the squint test. And my point is I'm not asking for quotas, no legislation. Thank you. But I should take a picture. I, I look at a picture of your executive team and it ought to kind of sort of look like the market that's being served. Yeah. If 80% of the market is women, then, you know, two token women on a 15, per, 15 person executive team just isn't right. Yeah. And, yeah. And then I move from there into the women in leadership and the women's leadership argument, I believe, as I see it, gets stronger with every passing day because it is pretty clearly a research demonstrated fact that women do better in non-hierarchical situations than men do. Women tend to use the word we more than I, and males have a, you know, I always, I'm so critical about this, and I was doing something actually this morning on Twitter. I always use the word, two words, tend to. Because there are men who can listen brilliantly and women who have tin ears. But if we are looking at two bell-shaped curves, uh, women tend to be better, tend to be better listeners than men. So it's yeah. not that all men are schmucks and all women are superstars in any way, shape, or form. But in general. And you're trained in all that stuff, too. So you know exactly what I'm talking about. You, I, you mentioned dataclism. You do mention data because my background's internet dating. And you do actually think, uh, I think you do quote dataclism as a book. Uh, Christian Rudder, yeah. who's yes. the uh, co-founder of OkCupid. Okay that, that was a real eye-opener of a book. Yeah. But yeah, i got to yeah. say, the internet dating industry is 70 80% male. You know, it's very yeah. strange. Matchmakers, 80% female. Oh, on that's fascinating. And then, oh, oh. Yeah. So what's the so you so I'm the questioner now. Tell me what the difference in approach is that leads to one being principally male and one being principally female. What's the what's the difference in structure? There must be a good reason. Geeks versus uh, heart and soul. So the matchmakers are heart and soul, and the internet dating companies are geeks. I mean, oh, that's, a, that's a huge, I don't like blanket statements, but I, I think the industry will forgive me for that. <laughs> so. Yeah, no, no, I'm sure that's the case. You know, the, the woman who wrote Brotopia, have you seen that? No, no. Brotopia, you've got to read it because you okay. lived in the valley. Brotopia is, a, you've got to read it as okay. long as you have a barf bag in your hand. It's about <laughs> some of the true wretched excess in Silicon Valley, but that's neither here nor there. The thing that was interesting to me relative to all the problems that, you know, people like Facebook are, are, are having now is one of her things was she said the fact that women are so underrepresented in terms of coding means that there's no, I don't know what word to use, female, feminine, women's sensibility in what the product is that comes out the other end. And you're kind of saying the same thing mm -hmm. with the you know, with, with the dating stuff, but there are different sensibilities, but try Brotopia, uh, if you can stomach it. All right. Will do. Thank you. I, uh, I've got a question from a prolific wisdom member, James Thomas. And so he asks, I'm going to read it off to you. Imagine a CEO of a traditional conservative company comes to you asking your advice on shifting his organization's culture toward recognizing and valuing the soft stuff. Uh, he and the majority of his employees are technical types, obsessed with numbers, metrics, systems, geeks, if you like, and procedures. What would you suggest to such a CEO as a first step to recognize the value of the soft stuff? Where does he start? Well, there are good, bad, and indifferent executive coaches. And, you know, a lot of people who can barely spell the word executive who hang out a shingle. Uh, I would want to spend a significant amount of time with him before I agreed to take up his challenge, uh, because culture is not some trip 
you lay on an organization. The example I gave, which maybe is what I would give to him as his first book to read, is McKinsey, when we did our In Search of Excellence work, was not too keen on the term corporate culture. And we were looked at as pariahs. We're looking at this uh, soft stuff. And the king of the hill in saying strategy first, strategy second, strategy forever was Lou Gerstner. And Gerstner went on from McKinsey to run a big hunk of American Express to be the CEO of RJR Nabisco and then got called in to do what looked like a near impossible turnaround of IBM. And he wrote a book, and I think I'm accurate on the title here, that said, Who Says Elephants Can't Dance? And it was about his 10-year turnaround at IBM. But what he says at one point is when I came in, I believed in strategy, metrics, and so on. What I discovered along the way was culture is not part of the game. Culture is the game. But presumably, and I either didn't read it closely enough or what have you, I would assume that that realization took Lou quite a while and quite a lot of discussion. And so I would never say hire a strategy guru. I would never say hire the good guys at McKinsey and they do a lot of it. I, I really think there's got to be an enormous amount of soul searching and it's not an off site and it's finding a handful. I mean, maybe what you do, which is always, and this goes back to my McKinsey days, is if it's a big company and the question you've been asked suggests there is, find a place that's doing it. You know, in my second book, Passion for Excellence, Nancy Austin and I called it Pockets of Excellence. Find a small division somewhere. And that's kind of the Gerstner thing, because he found some little, I don't know what a language I'm allowed to use on this particular conversation. He found some little pissant group uh, somewhere outside of London. And today they're called IBM Global Services, which is half the company. But find somebody who gets it. Find somebody on your team, you know, preferably, you know, somebody who's running Malaysia and doing things very differently. But, you know, I would I would never sit down and say, one, do this, two, do that, three, do this. No way. You, you've got to you've got to develop a, a, a feeling, a feeling for it. And, and if I was the would be consultant, I would think long and hard before I accepted his challenge. Yeah. Because, you know, hey, it, did it come because he bought a copy of Soft Edge or maybe my book and read it? Or has he really been noodling on it? Because it's a it's a deep seated psychological change. And it's, you know, as, as I say a couple of times when I'm talking about some of the women's stuff and so on, I am not talking about a women's initiative for 2018. I am talking about a strategic realignment of the institution. And so, you know, it, it ain't easy and you really got to be sure and you really need some partners, at least a handful of you. So uh, I, I, I think what I've just done is in a way evade the question, uh, but you know, I, I've said what I believe. It's not not one, two, three, bingo, yeah. bingo, bingo. Yeah, and that's really. I'd love to say read my book and God will smile on you from now until the end of time, but uh, I'm afraid I'm afraid I'm too old to believe that. Oh, but it does work wonderfully as a handbook, though. I mean, as I read through it, there are actually there's so many wonderful quotes, but there there, were, there was one quote that made me laugh. There was one quote that made me cry. Uh, let me share those with you. Oh, brilliant! I can't. I, oh, I'm so I'm you know here on the other side of the world, excited to hear what comes next. I'm really serious. Okay, so, what are we gonna start with? Laugh or cry? <laughs> start with laughter. So um, it was on the subject about listening, intense listening, and you, and you quoted Will Rogers, and Will yeah. Rogers said, "Never miss a good chance." Uh, never miss a good chance to shut up. <laughs> I know. Isn't that <laughs> lovely? I mean, that's, that, I that. honest to God, blowing my own horn, yeah, that's worth the price of the book alone. <laughs> and yeah. then leading up to the the one that led me to cry, it just seemed, uh, it just kind of dovetails in, in with our conversation that, that the CEO's role seems to have morphed. Vision is no longer enough, in short. Um, and a great demonstration of that is, uh, of course, Steve Jobs. And you talk uh, in, about design and innovation, and you quote Lauren Jobs. 
This was a real eye-opener. Uh, Steve and Joni would discuss... This is the quote. Steve and Joni would discuss yeah. corners for hours and hours. It's like, oh, that just struck me as simultaneously completely crazy and amazing. And, but then you, then you quote a book, uh, Boys in the Boat, about the eight-man crew oh, from oh the God. University I'm, of I'm, Washington. I'm going to cry listening to you talk about this. <laughs> yeah. So there's an eight-man crew from the University of Washington that won the 1936 Olympics. And the boat builder, a guy by the name of George Pocock, who talked about building the boat and said, you had to give yourself up to it spiritually. You had to surrender yourself absolutely to it. It's like, holy my goodness. Yeah, I mean that. <laughs> no, no, ab absolutely. You know, there's another little story I tell, which I think is, is consistent about that. And that is when my wife and I went to visit some friends in Chicago, which is, of course, restaurant city in the U.S. And for New Year's Eve, we went to this fabulous restaurant that's one of the most glorious restaurants in the city. So everybody, you know, has their last drink, finishes up a little after the New Year's bell rings at 1230. You walk out in front of the restaurant. This woman who runs it, owns it, is God in the restaurant world and was beautifully dressed for New Year's Eve. It's a Chicago January the 1st, the temperature is about zero, the wind is about 80 knots, she is standing out on the street hailing cabs. This was, I think, maybe 10 years ago and a little bit of pre-Uber, pre-Lyft or something, hailing cab. but it's that intimate connection. No, I love the George Pocock thing. Oh, my God. Um, if you, if you, did you read the book? Did you, did I've you not read get, that. No, no. I just, okay. I just, well, when you get it, it. when, when yeah. you go to Amazon and get it, yeah. make sure you get the hard copy, okay. hardback copy, because the hardback copy has photos. Okay. And it's just, it's just unbelievable. But no, I, I, I'm with you. Uh, and, 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 and to me, that's what a really great business enterprise of six or 66,000 ought to be about. And I remember reading, I don't know whether it was in Isaacson's biography or not, of Jobs, that Jobs would sneak off, and I guess he had the skill to sneak even when he was a big deal, and he would go to Japan for a couple of weeks, and he would go sit in the tea gardens again. And, and you know, somebody, everybody talks to me about hustling and, and you know, the and need for speed and in uh, product design. Somebody just asked me about that today. I said, don't forget, Jobs never came within 18 months of delivering a product on time. You know, he, it was not until it was ready to go. And it was, it was some, you know, the, the talking about corners, there's another quote in there from an Apple graduate, Tony Fidel, who runs Nest, who I think was bought by Google maybe. But he talks about the screws that go into a Nest thermostat, and he calls them epic screws, screws with meaning. And you know, you'd laugh yourself silly if nine out of ten people said that, but he means it. He really means it. And and I I, th I think it's the di and I think, which of course is the whole bloody point of the book at some level, that's the differentiator against the wholesale intrusion of AI that will serve us well. Look, you know this material better than I do. Uh, there's a famous Oxford study that said we're going to get overrun by AI within 10 to 20 years. There are people who are equally bright who say it's 25 to 40 years. My point is it's not going to be the next five to 10 years. And I'm not talking in terms of my advanced age. I will take a child like yourself. as an, We have to make it through the next five years. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and what are you going to do? There's, there's this wonderful quote in the book that doesn't make me cry, but it's uh, Linda Kaplan Thaler, who uh, started an ad agency, which was her ad agency. Somebody bought them eventually. Uh, she's in the Advertising Hall of Fame. And there's this wonderful quote from Ad Age. And she said, don't you dare think about vision for one minute. She said, we grew this agency, we did fabulous work, and we had only one goal in life, and that was to do our absolute best for our client today. And, you know, I nearly titled the book Excellence is the Next Five Minutes. And I've actually upped, upped my game in that regard 
since the book came out. And uh, you can, you're welcome to disagree with me. But I've said to the busy executive or non-executive, uh, excellence is your next 10-line email. I am not trained in psychiatry, so what I'm saying may not be entirely accurate, but I believe relative to you, I believe you're a boss, you're a leader of something that I could do a pretty complete psychiatric analysis of you based on a 10 line email. I can see who you are as a human being and, you know, call me arrogant, but I think I'm right about that. You know, is there some grace to it? Is there some thoughtfulness to it? Is there some humanity, even though the topic at hand is supposedly that your project is, is a bit behind. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and I think, I think I can nail you to the Mm -hmm. wall in terms of that. And, and so that's excellence. And if your next email, if my next email to you, who's one of my division general managers, or if you're a division, I'm a division general manager, one of my department heads, if my email to you is really all wrong, tonally, and this gets back to your earlier question about changing culture too. If my email's all wrong, uh, then forget all this other stuff. You know, it's, it's, and I, as I said, I'm hands shaking in rage about this 10 lines and I gotcha. Yeah. I haven't, I haven't tried it with any of my shrink friends to see if they would agree with me or not. I I may actually. It reminds me of a book, uh, the, Se- the Secret Life of Pronouns. No, I don't know that, no. but I love the title. I'm yeah. going to write it down. Yeah. So, so you know, people tell you everything if you only listen, yeah. observe. You know. Uh, well, there's a there's a the there's a thing that's the in the book about uh, Mayo Clinic, which always comes out as the top healthcare provider in the U.S. year after year after year. And if you're the world's hottest shot uh, heart surgeon and I'm interviewing you for a job, when you see me looking down and scratching with a pen on my arm, what I'm doing during the interview is counting the number of times you use the word we and the number of times you use the word I. And if you blow the we, I test, even though your nickname is God, you don't get a job. Yeah. (laughs) Is that a function of empathy, really? Do you think that's a a good... One of the things you mentioned in the book that it's very important to hire people with a good uh, empathetic empathetic uh, yeah. ability. Um, do you think that's a good way of measuring empathy? Then the we I test. I would think it is. I mean, I mean, you can you know you can do everything wrong, but you know I think you could maybe make it slightly more generic. That you know their point was, and Larry Bossidy in his book Execution said the same thing. He said when I'm interviewing a would be executive. And he used the pronoun she. It's not my bias in that regard that's doing this. But he said, when I'm interviewing a would-be executive, does she talk about the accomplishments of her team or to use his language? And I think I'm pretty close on this. Or does she keep wandering back to strat- strategy and policy? Yeah. But, you know, is it about the team and what, you know, we got done and this amazing thing that we got done when we – built our new facility in six weeks instead of six months. And so I, I think, you know, well, there's, a, there's another one, which is, is kind of just about my favorite. And, and one of my, it didn't bring you to tears. Pocock brought you to tears. But the one that almost brings me to tears is the guy who runs the midsize pharmaceutical company who says, we only hire nice people. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, you know, and what he says, which is something that the bros in Silicon Valley could take a lot more seriously, is he says, look, I know it's advanced microbiology, but there are a lot of people who are good at advanced microbiology. Why would you hire the jerks? <laughs> and, yes. and, you know, then he, then he uses the, yeah, and then he uses the, you know, the old one liner, but he, he presumably means it. And he says one this is, a, this is a small to middle-sized grow, uh, growth company. He said one bad, relative to our friend who wants the culture change, he said one bad apple can, you know, spoil the basket. Yeah. And then there's my friend Bob Sutton, who teaches at the Stanford Business School and Stanford Design School, who uh, is the author of The No Asshole Rule and now The Asshole Survival Guide. And, <laughs> but it's the same point. He yeah. says, you know... 
you don't have to do this and you yeah. don't have to live. And my point is, which is the joy of being a thousand years old. I, you know, my comment about myself is I have only one test about my life. Yeah. Can I walk past a mirror without barfing? <laughs> and you know, it's, and it's always a function of how you treated people. Yeah. You know, and when I'm doing my PowerPoint version, and I think I say this in words at some point in the book, I've got a slide that has a tombstone. And the tombstone says, Joe N. Jones, net worth $25,417,813.16 per N when the market closed yesterday. And my comment is, You've never seen a tombstone like that, have you? Yeah, yeah. When you go to the memorial service, and I'm stealing from uh, Peggy Noonan, who was a Reagan speechwriter, writes for the Wall Street Journal, and wrote about the, the sad premature death of one of our great uh, political correspondents, Tim Russert. And she said, at the end of the day, we always say, how did he treat people? Yeah. And it's, and it's really true. And, you know, I, I spoke to a bunch of senior middle managers one time, they were probably 45 year olds. And I said, look, you know, you got 20 years left to go. Let me tell you what you're going to remember at 65. You can remember the people you helped. You yeah, can remember that great. person who you helped develop, who went on and he, he killed you by leaving the company, but then he did something wonderful. And, and he's the one who's going to be, you know, in that last interior photograph in your mind before you, uh, pass away to bigger or smaller things. So, and I'm not, I'm not a religious person. I don't, I don't darken many church doors, but it's your Pocock point. You know, the, to me, you don't have to use the word organized religion and spiritual in the, in, in the same dimension. I mean, I totally believe in organized religion. That's not the point. It's just that, you know, I'm not, I'm not standing on a pulpit and whacking you over the head with a Bible. But it seems like there's some realization over the last several years that people are motivated by purpose and companies. I mean, Steve Jobs managed to um, create a workforce that believed in uh, computers as art, computers as a thing of beauty. Um, yeah. So, you know, and um, you know, so <clears throat> um, so let me pivot to a question from my friend Boris Simarinov and he he asks uh, most authors discover something new in the process of writing what were your personal ahas while working on the excellence dividend wow uh, well I'm sure there were a lot of them my goodness well no but the one there are a couple that stand out and you can find them in the table of contents. Yeah. Uh, I had no intention of doing, I did a people section, no surprise. I had no intention of doing a separate chapter on training. And I ended yeah. up doing a separate chapter on training. And moreover, I said, training is investment number one. That came as a surprise. In my leadership section, uh, there is a chapter which says asset number one in your sizable company is the full population of first line supervisors. They are responsible for quality, productivity, employee retention, and so on. I knew it was something I cared about. I knew it was something I talked about, but it's kind of when I look at the table of contents today, I say, oh my God, how did that happen? But I really felt this compulsion. I wrote the chapters and these two things were part of the chapters. Well, the third one, which you mentioned, the third one is listening and listening is a separate chapter. Mm -hmm. And I call them incidentally, training is investment. Number one, first line supervisors are asset. Number one, and effective listening is core value. Number one. And if you had asked me when I started the book that the, whether I would A, say that, or B, that these would be separate chapters, I would have, would have not known even what the hell you were talking about. So I guess that fits his, uh, fits his definition to a, to a very significant degree. And the listening one, uh, you know, as you may recall, the, the first chapter in the book is about execution. Uh, well, there was a lot of coin tossing that went on because I couldn't decide whether I wanted to put listening first or execution first. 
and ended up with, you know, with execution, but it was, you know, it was that, that high on my list. So those, those uh, three number ones, first line supervisors, listening and training, uh, surprised the heck out of me as to where they ended up in the contents list. I look at it today and say, did you write that? <laughs> so the book was a journey of discovery, really. As you were writing it, you were kind of bringing together your thoughts. Uh, yeah. Yeah, from, from your prior books. You know, I actually, mean, initially, it initially started out as a summary of everything, and we yeah. called it the exotic title, The Works, Yeah. Uh, you know, which is not terribly exciting. And relative to an earlier question you asked, it actually came from some teaching I was doing at the University of Auckland Business School, because yeah. when we go for our two months each winter, I go up to Auckland for about uh, 10 days and, and, uh, and talk at the business school. I love it. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. You know, and since, since I can take aim at you and myself, it's wonderful because it's not Harvard <laughs> or Stanford. <laughs> now, but what I mean by yeah. that, and you did this and you told me about your, your, you know, your Harvard thing is it tends to be 35 year olds who came back to school because they had a need in their own mind for education. And, you know, some of us do it at Harvard, some of us do it at Stanford, but it's, you know, not quite that kind of famous level of school, but people who, people are there because they want to be there yeah. as opposed to the fact that it's what you ought to do. And, and I just, I love working people who are getting MBAs more than smart ass little suckers like myself when I went to uh, Stanford in 1970. Yeah. Well, I think there's a whole other book that could be written about disintermediation of education. You know, ultimately, I, I remember doing a course and walk, I made a comment that was in the moment, but I, I basically said, everybody deserves a Harvard education. You know, ultimately, the teachers, the fantastic teachers, I think of Khan Academy, you know, Khan yep. Academy. I mean, there are just such brilliant teachers out there. And then there are facilitators. And I, I think I can see a day when you see this trend in Korea. Um, yeah, maybe that's a topic for another yeah. book. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's some some mixed models, and the mixed model is is do your MOOCs, and then have some opportunities to meet face to face. You know, years ago there was a woman who worked for my wife, who was her marketing director, and and she got an MBA at Duke from the Fuqua School. And it was a distance MBA, you know, it was a little before MOOC was in the language. But, you know, the deal was that they came to Duke uh, for a couple of weeks each year and met face to face. It was another school that I actually did a graduation speech for that was was a local school in Vermont. And it was it was really fun. It was the same sort of program, but they were finishing up two years of online stuff and they'd never met each other. But the graduation, in order to get your degree, you had to show up for the graduation. And so, you know, there's some, which is kind of a subtext of, of, of the new book in a way, there's some sweet spot of a combination of using the technology to its fullest and keeping the humanity. And, and I think it's possible to have that, you know, to find that sweet spot. I've got to go in pretty short order. So if you've got a last question that'll summarize everything, I would, I would love to give it a shot. I've got one quick last question from Shiraz okay. Yaved, and he asks, uh, looking back on your career, what would you do differently? He's going through some things right now where he's thinking about this question, and he asked me to put the question to you. What would you do differently? Uh, very little... I never had a goal. I never had a career plan. I went with the wind, uh, and the wind has been incredibly kind to me at the right moments. I mean, I'd love to say something like, do what you love, but I didn't start doing what I loved until I accidentally fell into it. You know, it wasn't, I really want to do this behavioral science. I'm an engineer. My grandfather was a German engineer who immigrated to the United States in 1873. I dream in numbers. I, you know, have 17 years of advanced calculus training. 
if you ask me why the hell I ended up talking about people and organizational behavior, wasn't my idea. You know, I got lucky. I went to Stanford Business School when I got out of the Navy, and I had a professor of organizational behavior, and he saw something in me, and we became friends, and then, you know, the rest. So so I, I, I just, I can't give a good answer. The, the only answer, and it's, I don't think it's very helpful to our questioner, is that I talk about and it is the excellence thing. It's if you're a junior person, it's always possible to turn a crappy little task into an island of excellence. Hmm. And, you know, the way I describe it is if you're the 24 year old who is asked to organize the Memorial Day picnic for your 30 person department, that's a golden opportunity. You know, you can make it into the biggest hoedown, hootenanny, great fun and so, I mean, that's, you know, your, your questioner obviously is, you know, 87 levels more senior to that. Um, but it's, and this sounds, I hate cheesy answers and it's back to that email. It's like, you know, I, I said, I called a speech excellence when I was at McKinsey because I had just come from a performance by the San Francisco ballet. And I said, if a ballet can be excellence, why the hell can't? a business organization be excellent. So you know, there's, there's something I just read and I wish I could recall it better, but it said that, you know, fundamentally excellence is the way you lead your life. And it's an un, some, somebody asked the, the elder Tom Watson, the IBM founder, um, you know, they said, how long does it take to achieve excellence? And he said, one minute. Yeah. He said, you achieve excellence by saying, I will never knowingly do anything again that's not excellent. And so I think it's the way you approach your life. And I can't say things like grab opportunities because it has nothing to do with my life. Uh, you know, one thing that's really important to me, and this is almost the antithesis of the answer, is I don't like mass murderers. And I don't like rapists. Those are number one and number two on my list of hated human beings. Number three is successful people who think they deserve their success. Hmm. It really is. Yeah. You know, anybody, you know, the, the, Nassim Nicholas Taleb wrote a wonderful book called Fooled by Randomness. And he said, if you're lucky enough to be born of intelligent parents and if you work your backside off, the odds are pretty high that you'll have a pretty successful career. If it's better than that, you were lucky. And when people say deserve, I mean, I say, yeah, sure, I deserved it. I was born in 1942 you know, in the United States of America. I was white, I was male, and I was Protestant. And Protestant meant a hell of a lot in those days. I said that was the first 99.8%. And the rest is details. I, I was one, one time had a guy who was chauffeuring me around London, actually, and he had driven Mick Jagger around. And what I remember him saying to me is he said, you know, I have two kinds of people in the back of this car, people who remember their roots and people who think they deserve to be there. And, you know, I thought that was as wise a comment, you know, as, as, as I've ever heard, but, you know, and I can't say stupid things like go for it or what have you, but you know, it's that next five line email turn that. Yeah. I, I wrote it on my 60th birthday. I wrote, I've forgotten what it was called, but I called, I call, I do know what it's called. It's called 60 and it was 60 ideas or 60 things that had influenced me. And the last one, which actually a Presbyterian preacher asked me about my Presbyterianism as a result, the last one was grace. And grace is a beautiful word. And grace is, in a way, you know, Johnny and Steve talking about corners for hours. Yeah. Or our great friend, Mr. Pocock, who left his heart and his soul in a, you know, in a, in a cruise shell. Uh, I must say when they were still made out of wood before, you know, before, before the, the worm turned, but it's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it, it's a way of living and it's, and it's, you know, the, the obvious one, which is religious with a lowercase r, it's caring about people. Yeah. I mean, what's to lose, right? Yeah. What's to lose? And there's everything to gain. Tom Peters. You're the author of In Search of Excellence and more recently, The Excellent the Excellence Dividend. Thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate your time.
It's my great pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity to chat.